Hi everyone, thank you. Well, you guys are hardcore. You've made it till, uh, to 4.20 in the afternoon, so I, I thank you for actually making time for uh, this last session on our wrist track. Um, today we've had some great speakers leading off with Larry who, who painted a picture of how to use historical data and, and to prove the metrics and some of the folklore and myths and religion around different agile practices and, and whether they actually do bear fruit in, uh, in a probabilistic way. So then we, we had Chris Schinkel, and I thank you guys for, for attending and, and speaking. He took us through how, uh, you know, risk, uh, how to integrate sort of thinking about the customer and doing small experiments can actually be one of your best tools to sort of minimize risk. And then we had, um, you know, Dr. Dan Greening here talk about sort of risk reduction metrics where he used the word scrum 48 times in a Lean Kanban conference session. <laughs> so this is my last talk for Lean Kanban. <laughs> uh, I'll be at Scrum Gathering next year, uh, and which he flew in from. So I do want to thank him for speaking, um, you know, in New Orleans and catching sort of the flight here to uh, to be able to present today. But what he presented was something that actually showed that a lot of um, the metrics that we do capture can be thought of in different ways, like how much of the backlog sort of estimated and forecasted is a leading indicator of communication between the product owner and the team. So it was his talk is, was about how to reinterpret metrics that we capture in a way that can allow teams to be managed well. Then Dennis got up and, thank you Dennis, where's Dennis, is he here? He's left. Uh, but he, um, he took us through some very practical way of uh, how to manage risk management today in software teams if there's no risk management practice in place. So uh, thank you Dennis for leading Agile. And my talk is a little bit different. I am gonna talk about how to sort of use not risks that you forecast may happen to a project, but how to think about risks in structuring teams and projects and understanding impact in a probabilistic way. So this is all brand new material. This is the first time through these slides, so I'm going to do my best to stay on track and on time, but I'm going to fail. And I put myself last in the day so I could go over time and they're going to lock the doors. So it doesn't really... <laughs> so thank you for coming. So. First of all, this is something I need to get people sort of thinking differently than the way you were taught statistics in school and the way you think about delivery schedules of costs and deadline. Uh, because things very rarely in the world match the great perfect normal bell curve distribution. So you're all now becoming pharmacists. You're a pharmacist and so now you're inventing a new drug. And we, we sort of know instinctively that when we're, if you're investing in drugs, not all of them are going to work. Some of them are going to kill the rats when they're tested after you invest a large amount of money. Probably we hope we stop short of doing animal testing before we find out that something's lethal or that it doesn't actually hurt, um, you know, it, it causes more harm than good. But it's the most likely outcome. So what you're looking at here is break-even point, zero dollars. You start spending money to invent something. And the quicker that you can spend money and decide that something has failed, the cheaper it is. So, although it would seem good that it doesn't hurt our lovely sort of little rat, what would be worse was that if we went and continued on to human trials and it killed humans, that drug's not going to get approved very often, um, at least not at the dosage which they tested it at. But what we're doing and what we learned through pharmaceuticals and very sort of risky sort of ventures where the chance of success is minimal, much less than the chance the chance of failure is much higher than the chance of success, is that we have multiple commitment points where we test. And we test and we see, is this heading in the right direction? Should I cut my investment right now? And one of the biggest risks I see in software development projects is where our inability to cut projects which are going to fail, to move on and think about doing something different. And in the software, we're a bit of a rarity. That doesn't happen in many other high-risk industries. In most high-risk industries, they constantly consider their options and try and exit early. Whereas what we try and do in software is, is persevere and, and use heroics. So say it doesn't kill humans. Say it actually does cure erectile dysfunction. <laughs> All right. So, so I know you're waiting to see what graphic I put up next for, for this one. So let me put you out of your misery. No Xbox. So, so what we have here is that there's a, a very low likelihood of success, but if we are successful, the payoff function is massive. 
And this is what we're trying to do in software. We're trying to invest our money as little amount as possible, exiting as early on the ones which are going to fail, to find these, what, what our friends here would say, black swans in the, in the backlog. So we've got Josh and, sorry, what's your first? Islam here. So if you haven't seen their work on black swan farming, they talk about how you might set this up in a company to get people to mine their backlog and find these little erectile dysfunction curing backlog items. So if anyone's interested, yes, I am playing speaker bingo here. I've been given a set of random words I have to work into the session. <laughs> so erectile dysfunction, tick. <laughs> so if you're going to be on at four o'clock, you better be excited. So stick around and hear the rest. <laughs> it's all up from here. So, so essentially, in software delivery, there should be no difference in, in sort of our understanding of risk and our probability of releasing on time. So we, we spend a lot of time estimating the amount of work if nothing goes wrong. And in fact, the chance of that happening is almost the infinitesimal in probability standard terms. Something's always going to slow you down. But this is where we spend all of our time of forcing developers in a room, swapping out sort of, um, yeah, swapping out, you know, using sort of planning poker cards or, or just trying to having to go on the record and split down features into, into smaller sort of stories. And what we really should be spending our time thinking about is what's going to shift this whole delivery data across to the right. And that's risk. So say we had two possible things that could go wrong that were massive, invented by Dennis's sort of u butte sort of um, way of getting people to brainstorm risk management. One would be a performance problem. It doesn't work as fast as we need it to. And one would be we didn't get the hardware for production early enough so we can't go live. Now what you would see just with a combination of those risks occurring, each of the binary combinations of um, one of the risks occurring, or either of them occurring, either a performance problem or just a vendor delay, you would see a very, that's the most likely outcome because it's, it, it, it's the normal amount of work we know we have to do, shifted across with some extra work so it's a little bit wider. Uh, but because we have two possible delays, this could be either of them, you get, uh, 70, you get a higher number of outcomes. Both of them going wrong has a lower chance of certainty. So this is a very simple case. Normally, you will have sort of five to 10 major things in projects. But if you think back to the projects which were late for you, can you think about something, a single event, a single piece of work, a single story, a single piece of infrastructure or delay, which stopped your project releasing on time? And that's what I'm interested in, in helping people find, those risk factors and shifting these histograms across to the left and eliminating whole categories of risk altogether. So that's my definition of risk. Risk is just um, the impact of uncertainty on an outcome, positive or negative, I don't care. Some people say it's just negative. I think it's both. I think sometimes you can be accidentally lucky and uh, things go well. So I think risk is just the impact of uncertainty. So I know Dennis sort of kind of put up sort of five categories of risk. My customers are a bit simpler than that. They can only deal with three. So I just go for financial risks, technical risks, and market risks. And the reason I draw them this way, uh, being sort of connected in a triangle form, is they all interact with each other. And they all cause sort of some regenerative effects. And the reason I make the center triangle a set of die is that there's a set of risks which just can't be managed. You can't do research to reduce the risk. There's nothing you can do about it. It's going to happen to you. And it's got a really fancy name called aleatory risk. But what it really means is um, just by jumping out of a plane, you accept some risk. There's nothing you can do about it. You're up high. What you try and do is you try and make sure that the obvious risks are taken care of. Do I have a parachute? Have I clipped it up correctly? Um, is the guy who packed my parachute sleeping with my wife. Like there's a whole set of things that you need to think about to sort of manage um, what's the risk that that parachute's actually going to open or not. Um, so well, there is a, a secret there, which was a, a process of once there, I was sort of doing some sort of defense work and um, I asked them how their quality control was for um, 
uh, army people jumping out of the back of planes because they had specialist people packing a parachute. And I sort of said, if it's all the same, can I pack my own? And they said, no. And I said, well, then can you at least tell me how you manage quality? Is This is a sort of a 17-year-old sort of kid who doesn't shave yet packing my parachute. And what they do is, is um, they pack parachutes and then their uh, supervisor comes along and he picks one at random and he throws it at each of the people who packed the parachutes and said, you're going up. <laughs> and what he did was, subtly, it's not the parachute that um, you packed that you jump with. It's something that your peers made, your peer packed because it was more about letting down your actual colleagues and it was about sort of, um, you'll take more risks for yourself than you will for other people. So anyway, it, there's a, I don't know why I brought that up, but it's a, it's a story about, I think we do in the workplace sort of often try and, um, we can manage risk for other people, but we have trouble managing it in our own life and for ourselves. So that comes up in how we actually assess risk and when we get to that, I'll, I'll delve further. But each of these have, UBO techniques, you know, uh, market risk, the lean startup people are trying to nail that one, how to run experiments. Financial risk, do we have enough cash to keep funding? How do we economically prioritize so we can maximize cash flow so that we can invest properly? Uh, that's sort of the cost of delay and um, how to choose the right projects to do. And then there's technical risk, which is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk about is just about how might we approach thinking about risks in these certain areas. Am I going on time? Cool. So the thing about risks, especially with these types of risks when they're linked in a triangle, is they're actually in a positive feedback loop. If you have a technical delay, that means that you're late to the market, which means there's low adoption, which means you don't have as much money to put into resourcing if you need to, to actually, which causes more delays, which causes low adoption, low cash flow. And a lot of risks in the world actually follow this pattern and it's called sort of growing hazard. In other words, the, the chance of something going wrong actually increases with the length of time that you're exposed to the risk. So we can reduce that exposure by doing shorter projects. Um, but the thing about it is, and just like all sort of aircraft crashes or any sort of accident sort of investigation, there's a sequence in a chain of things that went wrong, not one thing that went wrong. And if you can break that chain early, it's very easy to stop an accident occurring or a risk coming true. So the longer that you leave risk in a system, not only are the more exposed you are to that risk, you have a heightened chance that you actually start escalating and getting into, into, this, um, into this death spiral. So I just want you to kind of take away that risk causes more risk to occur. So as in currents, a risk actually is a, a leading indicator that you're actually going to have more risks occur to you in the future. So you must break the chain, chain early. And, and this is sort of known in sort of military parlance as, you know, you, you need to go and make early and meaningful contact with the enemy. The only way you, you, don't, you don't wait and you don't let them build up forces, you don't, there's understanding, this comes sort of a story through Don Ryan's and sort of training, is that only by sort of um, putting a system under stress early do you start finding out what the risks you need to solve. And the earlier you do that, the earlier you start breaking the chains in that regenerative process in, in failure demand. So I thought since I flew here, I would just sort of show this chart. And what this chart shows is the amount of time that planes arrive late, or, or actually, the, um, it's, this, on the bottom here is the time of the takeoff time, and the blue line is the number of minutes it's landed late. And you'll see throughout the day, at 6 a.m., there's about a seven-minute average delay. And when you get up to 6 p.m., you're up to a 20-minute delay. So it's actually, if you want to increase your odds of an on-time flight, you fly earlier in the day. Anyone got a guess as to why that might occur? The New Zealander in the corner. Okay. And so, so we have one there that, that sort of dependencies rise. So... That's absolutely right, is clever. If we look at um, the, the actual causes of the delay, so we drill into this data. This data is publicly available from um, Transport and Statistics, but I got it from the 538 blog, which is Nate Silver's sort of New York Times sort of company, which do these great visualizations. And, you know, it's all mostly sort of public data that they do it from. 
but you'll sort of see that uh, the late aircraft is is the predominant cause after 6 a.m. You know, about after 9 a.m. It is the predominant cause. You know, we hear about severe weather, which is those when we have bad weather events and it grounds a thousand flights, it makes the news. But one sort of United flight being late doesn't make the news. So we get sort of desensitized to the things that are actually causing the most damage. And we tend to react to these um, rare but major events. Remember that for about 10 slides when I get to sort of talking about that. But so we know that on the average flight delay, it actually matches the shape of the late aircraft pattern. So what we know is that we have a correlation between the time that you take off is the actual cause of the delay increasing throughout the day is probably due to late aircraft, but we don't know why. I put this little frog in the corner because I knew I, I needed, I had to. So scientists doing a test on a frog. He teaches the frog to jump. So he says, jump and the frog jumps. So then the scientist sort of writes down his notes and gets this all nice, neatly sort of tidied up. And then he chops the legs off the frogs and he says, jump. And the frog doesn't jump. And he concludes that the frog is deaf. The deaf frogs don't jump. Deaf frogs mustn't jump. So finding correlation and causation links is very hard. I know that sort of, um, how, many, how many sort of uh, right-handed people in the room? So we got about sort of 75%. How many left-handed people? So more left-handed, more right-handed people use Kanban than Scrum. Would that be would that be right? I mean, you know, in this room, just for the general population, that there's that there's a lot of there's more right-handed people in the general population. But if you just start taking sort of samples and you start looking at historical data or about what you have available, you can start getting very misled about correlation and causation. So. Um, just for the people, planes don't do one flight a day. The Seattle flight goes Seattle to San Francisco to uh, Boston, from Boston back to San Francisco, then back to Seattle. And every one of those legs, something can go wrong. The plane could be late, they've been waiting on the, that one last passenger that's still buying duty free. Um, there's all sorts of weather delays as they go across the country and they have to move around sort of certain sort of weather systems. Um, it snows occasionally in Boston. So um, when I book flights, I tend to look at the flights where the plane is coming from to choose which flights to connect to. And that's why in the earlier in the day, the plane is already at the source airport. It's not going to be late because the plane's not there. But throughout the day, those connections between multiple sequential dependencies on planes is actually uh, increasing your chance and the odds that something is going to delay you. Which is what we saw earlier, right? When I, um, when I showed those risk compounding, um, every the chance of a plane being delayed goes up at two to the power of n hops that it's actually going to be uh, flying. So the later in the day, you're up around four or five hops of a plane, you know, two to the power of five, one chance in two to the power of five that it will be on time. So it's almost impossible to be on time later on in the day. So, but as I say here, we don't know why the aircraft was late. We just know that late aircraft is what causes the uh, delays growing throughout the day. So the later you are, the later you get. And this happens in, in software all the time. So a bit of a math problem here. I know, it's, I know it's sort of late in the afternoon and you're all half asleep. But just imagine now, which this sort of happens in, I think the Australian and New Zealanders would understand this. We always go out after work. So the deal is, is four people have to go on a, to a restaurant and they won't seat you unless all four people are actually at the, at the sort of uh, table at the one time. What is your chance of being seated on time with four people going to dinner? Well, that's right. So we don't know anything about them, so we're going to assume that they're all equally as tardy. Thank you. So we're going to assume they're all equally as tardy. Well, the way you way sort of statisticians or logicians sort of solve this problem is they simulate. We look at all the possible combinations of a person being on time and being late, and we count the number of ones which are in the direction that we want. So there's only one case where everybody actually arrives on time. Every other of the um, 15 cases there is at least one person being late. Now in software to deliver, we need everything to be done that's, that's essential. 
one thing being wrong, one thing being late will delay a release if it's an essential piece of functionality or a severity one defect or something like that. So what happens in software is we stop thinking about average, whereas our intuition sort of thinks average, but what we are actually delivering is on maximum. Everything has to be right. So in understanding, once we understand that the odds are already counted against us, the more that we, we actually have to sequentially link things together. If this was four plane flights, four, four flight hops, the chance of your plane taking off exactly on time uh, is one chance in 16. I wanted to check that. You never do math on stage. So there's only one chance there. Now, this is a team dependency graph. This is sort of the core libraries here at the bottom. And if we needed to get, and you saw in Dan's talk where he talked about sort of true lead time, which was the time it took to make a change somewhere at this level for it to flow up through all the teams out into the UI. Um, this, is, this is life for a lot of large companies who are building sort of big products. And it's quite scary. Because if we look at that and we had to do worst case scenario of something changing the core library to get all the way up to the first, we have seven hops. So what are the chances of everything making it through on there unimpeded by a delay or a risk? Yeah, and I'm taking the worst case here. So now we'll just take the worst case scenario is if it had to go all the way from the bottom to the top and each team had to regression test everything that that change actually impacted, you have one chance in 128 of being right. And that's hard to, you know, the numbers look big, but how big? It's that one green dot up there in the corner. So every time we can remove or collapse a bit of, a, a bit of complexity in our team organization structure, we actually halve the chances that it's going to be late. So if I, if I sort of get, if I do change the architecture and I collapse some of those teams together, I can actually keep walking this up until it gets to something that, that doesn't scare people. All right. I guess the point of this stuff is that when you build complex, using a complex system with software technology, the odds are stacked against you, which is why you need to manage those, uh, manage sort of risk and, and really consider um, every opportunity you have to stay on track. And it's, it's not easy. So we, um, we need to actually use a, a bit of, uh, if it was easy, we would have been better at building software in the last 30 years than we are now. I think what we're doing now that's better than back 30 years ago is we're probably concentrating on the right things. And what are the right things? All right. These are, slides have been in and out about six times today. So I'm going to do this and I'm going to hope for the best. But if anyone's seen any of my previous talks, uh, which are online, I've, I've got a proof of why, why software lead time follows a Weeble distribution. It's the combination of things that we know have to happen, plus n number of things that could slow you down with a probability less than one. So what I'm saying is, is that what happens in software is there's an amount of work we know we have to do, plus one of 50 things that can go wrong, but it's really unlikely that they're all going to go wrong, and it's almost certain that none of them are going to go wrong. You're going to have five or six things go wrong, but you don't know which five or six in advance are going to affect each piece of work, and the interference pattern when you actually join those probabilities together comes out to a Weeble distribution. And over time, we've been understanding of what's happening there. Uh, from if I go back to uh, 1970 with the Larry Putnam sort of work, he sort of uses um, this curve, and I've sort of it has a certain shape parameter, and what I've been able to sort of see through different teams implementing Lean or implementing Scrum or implementing sort of in different DevOps style of teams, is that different styles of teams and practices they use shrink that curve. Um, and the theoretical limit of what we can get down to is actually that Weeble distribution with a shape parameter of one, which is an exponential distribution. Now, this is only about three days old, and I'm working with a sort of another guy on this stuff. But theoretically, to go below this, the longer something was in progress, the less risk it was exposed to. And what I'm after is someone to give me a story where that can be true. Because I think in software, what happens is the longer that something is actually in progress, 
the riskier it becomes and the more chance that it has been impact. If I'm right, then this is the limit that we can get to uh, no matter how we use lean practices to actually modify and manipulate lead time distribution. So I'm just setting, setting up that we're understanding now how risks combine to cause certain cycle time shapes. And by knowing that, can we do some sort of mining of that data and work out what risk gives the biggest reward to actually improve our likelihood of success? And that's what we're, we're sort of going to spend the rest of the talk about, is that um, this was waterfall. It's slow. Uh, oops. This was waterfall. It slowly walks its way back to exponential, which I see in a lot of DevOps teams. Why do I see that shape in DevOps teams? Because they're the last person in the chain that don't really depend on anyone else. They pick up the work. If the person who picks up the work can actually do it, but they sometimes get blocked internally, but they don't have any external blocking, this, this will be the shape of their cycle time. If they're a dev team, who uh, have a combination of internal blockers plus reliance on external parties and dependencies on other teams, this is the shape of it. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Some delays. So that's why you would probably, so that's why it's not universal. But the, the comment was, was that sometimes database teams do have external dependencies they have to deal with. In which case, I'd bet dollars to donuts that they would be more on this shape if we plotted their lead time. Um, I've got a session tomorrow on a workshop where I get right into this sort of detail about why this happens and how we can capture lead time. Because I want you all to become really good at it, because I want you to prove me wrong. So. Uh, what do we just learn by if we reduce risks or we reduce dependencies, every risk that we reduce halves the chance, halves the number of possible combinations that we can sort of be dealt with. So there is no risk vector that isn't worth removing. Every one of them in a, in a category has the opportunity to um, halve the number of delay cases. So now you go from 1 in 128 to 1 in 64. That's right. Thank you. So now, which ones are cost effective to remove? Sometimes they're there and you might just be worthwhile looking at and dealing with them. So how do you choose which risk is in your economic interest to remove? All right. So when I was faced with this problem, I sort of went back to, um, to some work that you know, was very common in the 1980s, which was around how to work out who you should send your direct mail marketing pieces to. And I know, so just for so the young people in the crowd, we used to write sort of letters on paper and we used to put, <laughs> the, we used to actually handwrite the envelopes with an address and it didn't have an at sign in it. Um, and, you, and we used to post these things out. Very expensive. So what we have to do is uh, work out how we can maximize our return on investment of who we send things, uh, these mail pieces to. Um, Commonly what you learn if you study sort of that science is that there's three vectors. There's the frequency that's, if you're looking at prior purchase history, there's the frequency someone bought something from you, how recently they bought, and when they bought, how much money did they spend with you. And all I've done is I've just changed frequency, recency, and rather than monetary value, I've just said impact. Um, oops. So what we're talking about here is, is yes, the reds are more frequent, but they're a while ago. So maybe we've actually fixed, if this was in a risk or a delay, an impediment sort of uh, timeline, maybe we've fixed the root cause of that and they don't occur anymore. And when they did occur, although the green ones happened more recently and fairly frequently, they didn't really block for very long when they did occur. So what we're trying to do when we're trying to work out, they're just, they're just two different types of risks. This one might be, no test environment available. One might be, I don't have a, um, a test environment to run something on. It's the same risk reoccurring. Yeah, it's the same category of risk reoccurring. I think it's Klaus in the room. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> bloody hell. Um, you and Jay should be brothers. Um, but 
uh, Klaus did some work uh, on his paper, one of his case studies, which talks about how to categorize um, different types of blocking events by, uh, you know, do you, what did you call it? Blocker clusters. Blocker clusters. So, yeah, they're individual occurrences, but they're of the same, if you found the root cause, it would be the same root cause to fix it, is what I think of it as. When I get people to draw these, I think them out. So then I, so then I, so I thought about it, I had these values, uh, and then I ran it by, I have a guy who sort of checks my math because I'm pretty bad at math. And he said that, oh, recency doesn't matter. Recency is a, um, it's just a psychological factor. You can't tell me statistically there's any, any sort of validity in recency reoccurring. So, so as of this morning, I sort of had to redo all my slides. But um, I know that there's some combination of these which would tell us what is the most valuable delay or impacting impediment to remove. Uh, and I'm still working out exactly sort of what that's going to be, but I'm going to show you one. I'm going to show you how I currently think is the, is the right way of doing it. But we should be starting to keep these. Every time something blocks you or every time there's a card or something enters a queue, we should start keeping metrics on that. Because if we don't have those metrics, we don't even have the way to mine the data to determine which ones, if we did remove them, would give the biggest bang for the buck. What one's going to improve our chances the most? So one thing you do have to do, and this is just a, a, a point that you will be sort of, uh, you might find interesting, is if we, if we do, if, if we think we've fixed something, a root cause, thank you, uh, Vince, if we think we've fixed a root cause, how many stories have to pass through before we're 95% certain that we actually have fixed the root cause? This should be something you're very interested in. Whenever you see something or when something doesn't happen, when you think you have a risk and you've chosen to monitor it and you've actually, uh, you're actually seeing things flowing through, how quickly should you be confident that it's not going to occur? And this happens in medical research when you're trying to work out um, side effects for drugs. And the way it's done is three on N. I, I, I put the fine print with the math, it has a Bayesian and a frequentist sort of solution. So both styles, there's, there's two sides of statistics, which is why Larry doesn't come to my talks and I don't go to Larry's talks. Um, one thinks that you can make decisions with a lot of data uh, and uh, make inferences from it. And uh, one thinks that, you know, what we're trying to do is all, all he can say is the odds are that he's right. So one's Bayesian, one's frequentist. There is a solution to why this formula, and it is a heuristic, it's not exactly perfect, but um, it does set the number of tests that you have to do before you're certain of a, of a side effect not occurring in a drug. And it also tells you that if you are gonna run an experiment on your end customers in the marketplace, how quickly you can be sure that um, you've done an, you captured enough data to know that you can stop that experiment. Something you should all be interested in. Um, especially understanding why, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna run an experiment on your customers, you're only gonna put 10% of your customers on a certain new feature, it's gonna take you longer to get to a result about whether that is just, uh, whether the outcome you found is just due to chance or due to your change. So three on end. So what does that mean? Say you're proofreading a book and you pick pages at random when you're proofreading the book how, and you don't find any grammatical errors. How certain are you with 95% certainty that the other pages don't contain errors? So with 20 pages, three divided by 20, only 15% of the, get this right. Yeah, only there's only a 15% chance that there's errors remaining in the other pages and then it goes down exponentially as you go so you sit of right? what's that the whole thing the whole thing no nope. if so there, there is this, there is this sort of, um, it's got to be independent test cases. If you pick, it doesn't matter how big the book is, if you pick the pages at random, then you are actually, um, then, then it doesn't matter. The less value you get from reading more pages. If you found no errors after you've read 40 to 60 odd pages, 
you get a there, there's almost no return on investment. That's exactly right. So if you're looking for defects in a code or you're doing code reviews of a certain person and you are picking them at random and they have to be independent and it can be really hard to be independent, um, then this, this is the heuristic that will get you to the point within a few decimal places of what the large math formula would have given you. It seems too simple to be true, which is why I gave you on the previous page when you get the slides, there's the mathematical proof of it and then there's the Wikipedia entry articles and more blog postings on on, on how it's used. And um, yeah, John Cook is a friend of mine, so we, we, we sort of work on this stuff. As long as it's picked at random and not by you. So then everyone talks about... Um, now... You try, you try stealing sort of clip art and get it right. Um, so, um, black swans, everyone talks about them uh, and they're written up and it's great sort of sensational sort of thinking. Um, and just like severe weather events, they happen rarely, but when they happen, they make the news. But if we look at the average case about whether they actually cause a true impact to the average flight time delays, it's, it's in the sort of minutes, one to two minutes, whereas late aircraft is up around 20 minutes. So it's 20 times more likely that you're gonna be impacted by a late aircraft than you are gonna be by bad weather. So you know, the quote is sort of absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. And for those who don't know about black swans, Europeans, uh, all swans in Europe, except now in zoos, were white um, until they traveled to Perth in Australia where they found that the swans were black. Uh, whereas, so everyone thought that swans were white and everything was written up in scientific literature about swans being white, all of a sudden they found a case that a swan was black. And in essence, you know, you can never prove that something doesn't exist. Um, you can just prove that it's unlikely to exist uh, because it only takes one sample to disprove that um, the swans, all swans, if I said all swans were white, I just need one black swan to disprove the case. That's why the scientific method is around disproving something because if we just said, have said everything we've looked at is white, it's misleading. So absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence in an absolute form, and that's true. Problem is you can take it too far. Because I, I am, you know, who thinks dinosaurs still exist? Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just sort of said that, um, you know, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. So you can't prove to me that dinosaurs don't exist. Well, we've been looking for a bloody long time and there aren't many dinosaurs around if they do exist, right? So what, we, what, what you find most people get upset with, um, you know, when you get hit in meetings by people talking about black swans is that they're overemphasizing their actual occurrence. They're called black swans because they occur very rarely. When they do occur, the ones you want to worry about are the ones which have massive impact. So, it always depends on consequence. <laughs> oh, I forgot I left that in there. So, uh, so there's... Uh, so, you know, I guess what I'm saying is, is the consequence matters. So what's important is to put fences around things. If it's going to kill you or kill your company, then of course consider it. And it doesn't matter even if it's 0.5% chance of occurrence. If it's life-threatening or it's got an extinction level event for your company, you gotta deal with it. You gotta, you gotta put barbed wire around those risks, but don't obsess over it. Don't make everything a black swan. Don't say, oh, oh wait, wait a second, wait a second. You know, if our production hardware catches fire and we lose a database server halfway through a replication, we need to do X. Don't let that block your delivery to, to your customers. And sometimes when you do risk management, you get hit by these absurd cases and you just got to slap people across the head. So this is what I sort of tend to do in looking at sort of impediment risks is I go and capture the actual impacts in days that I have in, in, in sequence from the sort of impediment clusters. I sum them together for the last three months. So I don't want to go past three months because we might have fixed the root cause. So I'm trying to account for recency. I order them from the highest impact to the lowest impact. We discuss the root cause for the top 10 and what we might do about it, how we would fix it. 
and then we do some economic prioritization of them. And I've just sort of bastardized sort of weighted shorter job first or CD3 where I sort of said economic prioritization means if everything took the same, if everything yeah, took the same amount of time to do, but one would give you a really big payoff uh, or three would give you a big payoff and one would give you a low payoff, what order would you complete these projects? That's correct. Now, if everything gave you the same return or you know, stopped you losing the same amount of money if you were late and they took all different times, which order would you do now? All right, but the world doesn't work that smoothly. So what we need a way of doing is trying to blend the two things. Some things are high, some things are low. And what I'm suggesting is weighted shortest risk first. <laughs> All right, um, which is on the uh, numerator would be just the sum of the lay times of the same risk clusters uh, for the last three months. Pick your time. I don't know what works for you. Divided by the effort of the resolution time how many resources you're going to put on it, how much effort you're going to put into actually solving them, divide the two and start doing the ones with the highest number first. It's exactly the same theory that we do for the rest of prioritization for the rest of the backlog. But what we're trying to do is sort of saying out of the risks that we have, out of the impediments that we see and the improvements that we could make to our process, which ones are going to um, reduce risk at the fastest rate without killing us in the process. So with that, uh, photos. I'm sure I'll make the slides available. So um, seems to be the thing now. Every time you talk, oh, you're saying I'm over time. Um, I'll make sure I post the slide on my sort of website. Um, just go to focusobjective.com. Um, send me an email. I will get you the slides somehow. As they were finished five minutes ago, they're not posted anywhere just yet. Questions, Jay? Yeah, um, I, I think it, during, I would like to think that I do a lot of this at the beginning of the project and less of it at the end. So I think I would probably try and cross the, um, cross the streams. Does anyone know that reference anymore? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> so so uh, I would try and I would, I think it phase the project matters, which is why there's no absolutes in any of this field. When everyone says estimate, don't estimate, I think, you know, I just sort of lose respect for them because there's there's no absolutes. There's always context, and you and it matters. So um, great question. So just repeating the question for the camera it was: um, Should I blend this with the rest of the cost of delay prioritization for the rest of the value work? And I think I would go higher on these and earlier in the project, and then sort of. Um, move into the stream because if you get these right, you've burned down risk early and you're going to be able to deliver more value uh, reliably and predictably. Question. Did you get any pushback from you know, business customers at the end of, of the last few that that business value features have been going that, no, no, we just put 90% of our backlog into this thing which is different? Yeah, one of the things you need to do with risk or anything like that, so the question was how do you, how do you tell the executives that it's um, this is a good use of their dollar value? Um, because of these risks, I can actually sort of say, if we don't fix it, it's going to happen at the same rate going forward, which is going to cause our release to be three months late, which has a cost of delay of, of $6 million. Um, would you like me to spend $50 and buy that new hard disk? <laughs> um, so you've got to bring the question back to economics. And because we actually know the amount of time that these are going to delay in the rate, we can actually predict linearly what the impact is going to be on the project completion time. Joshua. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, so I. So I. This is where we. Well, so if you said, so when I, I would have said, I convert things back to delay time and then work out the cost of delay of the project. Well, the cost of delay of your project. Which is, yep, that's right. That's, that's what I do. I express it in the cost of delay of the value they're not getting because these exist and saying to fix them will take this amount of investment. You want to have a bus to catch because it's five. Sure. 
Sure, sure. Uh, listen, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. Um, see you next year.